In 1920, Indonesians organized the first communist party in Asia. In 1927, Indonesia's communists rose in revolt. The Dutch crushed the rebellion and executed its leaders. With the communists finished, the Dutch relaxed. They thought they had destroyed all opposition to their rule. They were wrong. We became to the realization that we really belong to one nation only very late. I think 1920s, you know, 1927 and 28, when the younger generation of Indonesians came to realize that we could never win back our independence without becoming united as one nation. And I remember friends became very attracted to the red and white flag of Indonesia. We joined up with the nationalist uh, scout movement. There we were told by our older brothers and by the older leaders you must not forget, not ever forget, they told us that in this fight, our main enemies are two, the capitalists and the imperialists, and both are Dutchmen. But most of the nationalist leaders were intellectuals educated in Holland, more at home in the West than in their native land. What the movement needed was a charismatic leader, someone who could persuade millions of ordinary Indonesians to forget their tribal loyalties and unite as one people against the Dutch. In the late 1920s, that leader appeared. The schoolboy Sukarno had come of age. <laughs> Anybody who listened to his speech would be moved. He was able to empathize with the desires of the common people. He gave the people a sense of self-confidence. Sukarno's own self-confidence was limitless, especially with women. He once said, the smile of a beautiful girl is God's reflection. Why is it a sin to take her? To his countrymen, he was an irresistible mix of playboy, patriot, and matinee idol. Sukarno is like in America, a combination of George Washington and Clark Gable. The first time I met him as a younger man, he's already asking, what movement, news movement you are joining? And then he's explaining, I have to join one of the movements. And I follow him. <laughs> Sukarno preached the need for national unity and the dignity of the common man. He was fiercely anti-capitalist, but he was not a communist. He simply believed the Indonesian masses should be free to labor for themselves, not for the Dutch. I was consumed by a burning desire to set my people free. It was more than a duty. For me, it was a religion. As a boy, Sukarno was spellbound by the heroic warriors of the Wayang Kulit, and by the Dalang, the master puppeteer who enthralls his audience with epic battles he conjures from lamplight and shadows. As a man, Sukarno became the great Dalang of Indonesia's nationalist struggle. Over his people, he cast his own hypnotic spell of modern revolutionary thought and ancient Indonesian myth. The Dalang manipulates the puppets, so Sukarno also manipulates our own people and all the mystical forces in our culture for his own political ends. He can quote you Marx, he can quote you Jefferson and the other Western philosophers you know, very easily. I have got them all in his mind. But at the same time, he also used these old mythical symbols of Indonesia, especially of Java and Bali. He used to tell people in Bali <coughs> that he is a, <coughs> uh, is a descendant from Vishnu, the Hindu god. 
So when he arrived in Bali and it was done raining, he told the people, look, I bring rain for your rice fields, you know, things like that. And he could do it very well indeed that maybe, you, maybe he's one, you know. The Dutch were also impressed. In 1929, they arrested Sukarno and other nationalist leaders. In 1933, they exiled them to remote outer islands. Indonesia's deliverance from the Dutch would have to wait until events outside the country recalled an ancient prophecy of yellow-skinned liberators from the north. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. On December 8th, the Japanese attacked the British colony of Malaya. On December 10th, they landed on the Philippines. On Christmas Day, they captured Hong Kong. The Japanese armies continued driving south, crushing Western colonial forces in their path. They occupied French Indochina and took the British bastion of Singapore. At the end of February 1942, their invasion fleet appeared off the coast of Java. As the Japanese grew near, Indonesians quietly hoped. In 90 days, they had seen an Asian country humble the power of England, America, and France. Perhaps the ancient prophecies of deliverance were about to be fulfilled. You might have heard that there was a Joyopoyo king in the 13th century who predicted that once Indonesia will lose its freedom, and then later on, after so many years of white supremacy, will come a yellow ox uh, coming here in Indonesia only for the duration of the mice plan, you know, of the corn plan. And after that, then we will be free. Well, that is the Japanese. So when the Japanese arrive, my mother, you know, is planting a uh, corn plan to, <laughs> to, to see whether it comes true. Eight days later, the Dutch surrendered all of Indonesia. Seeing their masters humiliated, Indonesians rejoiced. After 300 years of Dutch invincibility, it truly seemed that a miracle had happened.